All right, I'm here with Dr. Anthony Chafee, who's an awesome guy. Hey, Doc, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Hi, right, Momo. Thank, thank you for having me on. Uh, actually, I, I didn't actually have breakfast. I, know I quite often don't eat breakfast. I'm quite, uh, you know, I, I generally have, um, you know, one big meal a day or two big meals a day, usually later in the evening. And when I get up, I'm usually not hungry. And so I just get up and I go. I don't need to stop for lunch. I don't need to slow down in the evening. I just I just kind of kind of do my thing. Last night I had uh, a big steak and a whole duck. <laughs> so <Nice>. the, <laughs> uh, from a, I got that as the takeout. But yeah, it was good. Nice, man. Well, I wanted to have you on here because first of all, you've been requested multiple times, but you've got a, you know, a kick in physique. You clearly do the work. You clearly know what you're doing with nutrition and exercise. You're a big animal-based guy, and I really want to just dive into this. But in addition to that, I mean, you've got some pretty serious credentials as well. So can you tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you're all about just in a 30 second elevator pitch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just an American uh, medical doctor and I, I'm specializing in neurosurgery. So I'm still in my residency training for that, but I've had just a, a, a real interest and passion for diet and nutrition, how that affects health and chronic disease. And I've just sort of made, made some sort of, you know, insights and discoveries that have made me go down the path um, thinking that a, that animal based diet is better for our health and that we can actually augment or even reverse or at least help significantly quite a lot of the disease processes that we see today in modern medicine and sort of when i started thinking about that in that in that sort of manner that you know humans are a kind of animal and the kind of animal we are according to the, you know the best research i've seen is a carnivore and so you know we're eating outside of that and we're getting sort of diseases um, as a result of that, just like if you know you have a sign at the zoo that says you know don't feed the animals, you can make them sick. You know we have sort of the same processes. We should have that you know on our fridge, and uh, and so that's that's sort of what I've been doing is just trying to figure out more as much as we can, and just try to help people get better without taking a bunch of medications and even come off medications. No, right on, man. Yeah, and I know you've helped a ton of people. I mean, I've seen this stuff out there, so I mean it's it's awesome to have you here, and it's awesome to dive into this. So. We're going to get mechanistic with some stuff, but a lot of this, I think we just want to talk, you know, lifestyle. I mean, like really the first question I have, and I know it's kind of a broad question, but who would you say is sort of the prime candidate? Not necessarily as a whole. I know everyone as a whole could do really well with animal based, but who's really a prime candidate? Like for someone that's really just struggling with some stuff, like who really fits the mold? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think it's, it's generally the, these chronic disease issues, you know, and I think uh, especially like autoimmune issues, these things, these things just disappear. When, when you stop eating just plants in general, but certainly carbohydrates in particular, you, you find that people do re remarkably well. I have a number of patients that have Hashimoto's disease, Graves' disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, rheumatoid arthritis. These are things that are devastating to people and to their health, and, and they cause a lot of harm, and they're normally uh, you know, thought to be incurable, and you have like DMAR, that's like the main class of, class for these drugs are just disease modifying agents, and so they're they're not even saying like, hey, this will fix you, this will cure you. It's just like, well, we can modify it, we can slow it down and mitigate it so it just kills you slowly over forty years instead of all in one go. But you go on, you go into uh, just a meat based diet and you get rid of um, you know, most plants, if not all plants, and people people respond very very well. I I have yet to see. Uh, someone with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis not have full resolution on biopsy of their of their intestine in three months. And most of the time they're in remission within a few weeks. And we actually have this in the literature as well. We have just uh, like uh, they call it you know, um, a, a fasting mimicking diet, which is you know people in the community will know is just a, a keto diet. You know, you're getting into the fasting metabolic state and people that on a, on a, on a keto diet or even on an elemental diet, which is just getting just the macros and micros that you need and, and none of the, of the rest of it, which is sort of what you can think of as, as our species specific diet. If that's carnivore or whatever it is, you're just getting what you need. You're not getting any of the rest of the stuff that you don't need that that has a better efficacy treating an acute flare up of Crohn's than steroids, you know, and that on, and they've done randomized controlled trials as well, uh, looking at, people um, on, a, on just a, a keto diet, so like low, no carbs, no fiber, uh, versus just a carbohydrate and fiber eating group. So they didn't, that was a control group. And they found that the people just eating keto with no fiber, on average, kept their Crohn's in remission for 51 weeks, whereas the, the control group had an average of zero weeks, right? So this is, this is 
already in the literature has a, has a huge benefit and I've seen it in practice. It really helps them. So all these people with these so-called chronic diseases that we see do really, really well because as, as I sort of make the argument, these chronic diseases are not actually diseases per se, but they're really toxicities, toxic buildup of a species inappropriate diet and then lack of species specific nutrition. So, you know, too many plants, not enough meat is, is sort of where I'm coming from with that. And in practice, that's exactly what I'm seeing. Interesting. So when you, and when we talk meat, are you, are you much more of a muscle meat kind of person or you dabble with the organ mm -hmm. meats or kind of what's your, what's your take on, and it's mm -hmm. interesting because I, I get curious about sort of the methionine piece too. Like, okay, are we having too much muscle meat and not enough organ meat? Does that really matter? I know this gets nuancy, but this is actually a genuine curiosity because I know that's, mm -hmm. I, I research a lot in the longevity world, obviously, and that's, it's a piece where I don't fully buy in. I'm like, okay, the methionine <laughs> piece is important. I see that. I can see that in rodent model stuff. Mm -hmm. But I also understand how important a muscle mass is for metabolic health in general, but kind of looking at this big piece. So what's your take on sort of the whole nose to tail approach? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's fine. I think that uh, I, I just basically do muscle meat and, okay. and that's it. And a lot of people do. And you look at like the, like the Inuit, the quite a lot of what they're eating is just the skeletal muscle meat and fat. And obviously there is a different, different sort of beast when you're, when you're, eating marine mammals because they have like toxic levels of vitamin a in their liver you know like, like a yeah. polar bear liver you even, yeah. even eat a yeah. small amount of that it will, it will just kill you and so you, you can't do that and um but a lot of people do this and a lot of people in the carnivore community have, have been doing this uh literally for decades just eating ribeyes and so i think that that people can certainly thrive just on that it's perfectly fine if you want to eat organs and I, I think it's actually beneficial in a lot of in a lot of ways but i think that you could also overdo that i think anytime you're you're doing nose to tail you should think about it in proportion of the animal like we're, we're like the whole idea is that this is sort of how we evolved and if if we're doing that then we have to sort of think about how we came across this animal in the wild as well so you know if you kill a if you you know take down a buffalo and you're eating that buffalo i mean that they're a very large animal with a lot of meat on them you know that thing's going to feed you as an individual probably for like two years yeah you know how many livers does it have it's just the one so you know you're going to have basically one liver spaced out over two years so I, I don't think that you have to have you know 500 you know grams of, of liver every single day or you're going to have a problem um i haven't i've probably had liver twice in the last, in the last like 10 years and um and it's fine and you know and I, I even noticed i i like it and, and for some reason raw liver is tastes way better than cooked liver yeah. like that was something that i discovered and so i would actually have a couple pieces of raw liver I'm like, oh my God, that's actually really good. But then I get a couple pieces in and I'm like, yeah, it's not that great anymore. I, I can I can put that down. And I think that that taste response is actually very important because what I've noticed as well is that, you know, you could be very hungry and you start eating a steak and it's just the best thing you've ever eaten in your life. And then as you, as you go through it, it sort of tastes less and less good. You're getting less of a positive feedback because your body doesn't need as many nutrients anymore. And then I get to a point where I'm like, ugh, I'm just not enjoying this anymore. And it's the same steak cooked at the same time. It should be as good, but but it's not. It tastes different. And I, I noticed that with liver as well. And 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 some people too will be, they can be quite nutrient deficient coming from like a standard American diet where they're probably deficient in a lot of things. Liver is your best friend. And so they're like, man, liver tastes so great. And then after two or three days, they're like, I don't really like liver anymore. And it's like that, that you can probably listen to that, that response as well. So you took the words out of my mouth because I think a lot of times when people are eating a standard American diet, typical hyper palatable garbage and mm -hmm. totally devoid of any nutrients whatsoever. And then all of a sudden they see someone like Liver King talking about liver. So they eat a couple ounces of liver. And, and candidly, that's probably like the most nutrient dense food they've had in the last year. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, I feel good. Well, maybe you just got a little taste of what it tastes like to mm -hmm. be a little bit more nourished. I don't know. <laughs> but, you yeah. know, I noticed that. Right. But it's also a huge confirmation bias and placebo effect too. It's like, you know, you're watching all this content surrounding this. You're like, I'm going to feel like an animal if I eat this liver. And then you probably do manifest that to a certain degree. <laughs> but yeah. it's, yeah, I mean, I find that super interesting because I've kind of, like I've never been a huge, huge organ meat guy. I have kind of in the same school thought. I typically have, I don't know, maybe an ounce or two of liver every couple weeks just because I'm like, all right, cool. Maybe I'll get some nutrients out of this. Maybe I'll get something out of it. But it's not like I'm going out of my way, right? And it's interesting yeah. to kind of see different communities split on this. And the research is just, it's just, I, I agree with you in the sense that if there was a tribe or some group of people that made a kill, that organ meat would be divvied up amongst how many people. Mm. I don't necessarily subscribe to the thought that if I eat testicles, it's going to make my testicles healthier, you know? <laughs> so, but, no, I don't. 
I, I've never eaten a testicle. I have no, no, no problem saying that. <laughs> Do you, are you, what about, uh, what about like raw dairy, anything like that? Is that, is that within your wheelhouse? Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes. Yeah. So, so raw dairy is certainly better than, than pasteurized dairy. That's, uh, I think that's, that's, um, my view on that anyway. Um, I think that some people can have more of a problem with dairy though, especially like with the autoimmune, uh, people, they're very sensitive to things and they might even be sensitive to the things that, that when eating a carnivore diet, they might be sensitive to the things that their animal ate. And so they can, they can have a bit of a reaction to, you know, like, you know, grain fed chicken and pork and things like that. They do much better on, on ruminant animals and, and red meat. And obviously, you know, even better on grass fed red meat and, um, the, dairy side of things they seem to to really react with that and obviously you know we we sort of know about the you know these sort of casein proteins and like the a1 and a2 proteins in milk and a1 is is quite pro-inflammatory uh well you know relatively it's it's much less inflammatory to a lot of other things but you know a2 is is much less but it it is still partially inflammatory most people don't have a problem with that i don't have a problem with that so occasionally i'll use dairy uh as a condiment so um, you know, like maybe melt some cheese or something like that onto meat or have a bit of, you know, sour cream or, you know, live culture yogurt sort of mixed in with some ground beef or something like that just for a bit of flavor. And and that's, I do fine with that. Uh, but people with autoimmune issues, uh, they may not, especially early on when they still have to heal their, their sort of gut health and they're still having, uh, especially like when they have like leaky gut, a lot of people have yeah. leaky gut. There's mm-hmm. a lot of things that cause that. And so more things can slip in and especially people with autoimmune issues, they, they are much more sensitive to that. After about sort of three, four, five months, they can tolerate these things a little bit better. But I always I tell people just just be mindful of that and and use it sparingly and as a condiment because while it has while it's okay, it has a lot of very good things for you. It's it's not complete nutrition like a steak is. Yeah. And so you know you're you're not going to be. It's not as good. It's not as optimal. And I I shoot for optimal just because I I like feeling my best all the time, and. Um, you know, and, and then, so that, that's what I shoot for. I don't, I don't think anyone else has to do exactly what I do or you have to be perfect all the time. I'm not dogmatic in that. I don't, I don't care what people do. I just, yeah. I, I just want them to know sort of what I'm thinking and, and where I'm coming from and, and they can try to apply that, uh, to their life and just make their own decisions. But, um, I do like dairy and that uh, can be a problem as well, because like, especially like with milk, like I've looked, like raw milk is amazing. Like you drink yeah. this and you're, you're just like drinking pure life force. Yeah. Like, oh my God. And, um, but that's a problem because I'll drink a lot of it and it has enough lactose that it will, you know, spike your insulin eventually. And, and then, um, you know, just screw up your, your metabolism. So I avoid that every, every now and then I might have some raw milk, but it, but it is quite rare. I generally just stick to meat. I put a link down below for thrive market. If you want to get like some protein snacks, they've got things like chomps, they've got beef jerky. They've got really good things to snack on, but the best part is there's a 30% off discount link. They are a sponsor on this channel. They have been for five or six years. It's how we create the content that we create and keep going and pay our team and rock and roll. But the best part is you get a discount. That's a 30% off discount link. So you can shop at Thrive Market, do your full grocery shopping there. They even have meat and seafood options that are much more sustainable, which is great. Already generally cheaper than the grocery store and it gets delivered to your doorstep. So 30% off using that link down below for Thrive Market. I'm not saying Thrive Market's gonna fix fatty liver. I am saying they are gonna give you the tools to revamp your lifestyle. And as this video goes on, I think you'll understand more of what I'm saying. So after this video, check out that link down below in the description get some groceries delivered and get a $50 free gift as well when you use that link. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. I mean, we can go down a rabbit hole with the dairy piece, but it's, you know, it, no matter where you stand on what literature you pull up, at the end of the day, you have to look at how you feel. And it's interesting, like if I'm heavy on dairy, there's no doubt about it, I feel sluggish. I don't feel as good. It's, you know, and that counts for something, right? And it's a lot of people are that way. And I think a lot of people think that it's purely the lactose. I think they forget BCM7, bioactive opioids, and any of the other components that are in there when you start overdoing it. Mm-hmm. And we're not really designed to be maybe taking in as much as we take in as a society in the first place. So yeah, I'm with you on that. I think the bulk of my dairy comes from, you know, if anything, raw kefir or anything like that, you know, fermented a little yeah. bit. I tend to feel better on the gut that way. Um, yeah. I wanted to kind of get into... I guess for lack of a better term, the the meat and potatoes or the steak and eggs of a lot of this. Um, there's been a lot of buzz surrounding insulin resistance in general, whether it's carnivore, whether it's keto, whether it's a standard American diet, like this is just trending and people are talking about it a lot. 
And I feel like as the platform that I have, I try to put good information out there to help people that might be diabetic, to help people that are, are struggling with this and help them at least wrap their minds around it. And one of the things that continually comes up surrounding even a lower carb protocol, but it definitely comes up a lot with carnivore or with animal based is this idea of, you know, physiologic insulin resistance, where you are basically having elevated levels of glucose when you're low carb. We understand that this is sort of a reallocation of glucose going to the brain. You're not needing this glucose, but you know, people get concerned that it's going to cause the same sort of problems that say pathological insulin resistance would. Could you just give a shine a little bit of light on this and just give some clarity for people that are maybe concerned about this with low carb? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I, th I think one of the main things to, to know about is, is when you're sort of in a, in a, in a you know, fat driven metabolic state, you don't you don't need to have a highly tuned up, you know, you know, glucose, uh, you know, response system. Um, obviously, insulin you know, uh, is uh, as a driver of glucose going into your cells when you're not eating carbs, your body makes carbs, obviously gluconeogenesis, your body is, is making blood sugar and liver glycogen and muscle glycogen and things like that. It's replenishing them at pretty much all times. You have very, very steady, stable blood sugars, uh, and glycogen levels, you know? Um, but, and then you'll see, so pe you'll see people when they go back and they start eating carbohydrates, they'll have, maybe they won't have a very good, insulin, uh, well, sorry, uh, um, response to like a, a glucose tolerance test, which is like a marker for diabetes. And so people all of a sudden they go like, Oh my God, my, my glucose tolerance test is, is up. That, that is an initial response, but a major, major reason for that. And there's, there's, there's a couple of reasons for that, but a major reason for that is that when we're eating carbohydrates, while our insulin levels, our serum insulin levels stay relatively low or the same, you, we actually load up insulin in our pancreas or our beta islet cells will actually make uh, insulin early and it'll just as, as sort of like a, a, an anticipatory response. And then so you make it, it'll release it right away. And so that that can actually be why you're, you're getting a bit of a delay because all of a sudden you're, you're eating carbohydrates and your body goes, oh, where'd this come from? But then it'll start making it'll start making insulin after that. And then after a couple of times of eating carbohydrates, your, your body will, will prime itself and, and have insulin ready to go. And so you'll actually see a reversal of that. And so it, and that, and that goes for years. You know, there's the professor Ben Bickman from from uh, BYU, he's been studying insulin and the uh, metabolism for you know, over 15 years now, and and um, I was speaking to him, and he was saying that like you can see, you can see people actually years and years and years down the track, they'll have that same sort of response, and so you can you, you're not causing like a permanent insulin resistance or anything like that. It's just that initial response more than anything, and then your body sort of gets tuned into it, and you go back to carbs. So you're you're not losing anything by not eating carbohydrates, your body will readjust pretty uh, readily after if, if you reintroduce them. Yeah, I mean, that's super fascinating because one of the things that you know we always talk about is sort of what's happening on the periphery, right? It's just, uh, just at a cellular mm -hmm. level, right? Maybe it's, you know, more upregulation of or activation of PPAR alpha, you have more just, you know, fatty acid transport, more carnitine palmitoyl transfer, all that, right? But I didn't really understand about the pancreatic side just in and of itself mm. that there's just this delay so that so it's actually kind of a double whammy. You have it happening on the, at the periphery level, sort of at the cellular level, and then also at the uh, pancreatic level as well. So, I mean, it makes sense why. And even though, you know, I know you and Paul Saladino have difference of opinions on things, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of also overlap. And he, when he was on the mm, channel, yeah. he was he was talking about some interesting things surrounding, um, you know, just, just that delay, right? People freak out if they go back and they have some carbohydrates. In his case, he was talking about fruit specifically with his given situation. But, you know, people freak out if they have some fruit and their, their blood sugar skyrockets for three days. When I say skyrockets, it really doesn't even skyrocket. It's just going yeah. kind of a steady higher range than it normally would be and it still seems to come down normally too but it freaks people out because there's so much content surrounding blood sugar everyone thinks that if their glucose is above 100 that they're immediately uh you know have a death wish right uh so it's just interesting to understand this and and see that it kind of like fizzles out after a couple of days and everything kind of comes back into balance as your glucose tolerance improves uh, yeah. Do you typically find that, I mean, if someone were to say, hey, I need to deal with these aches and pains, I need to deal with these chronic conditions, I'm going to go carnivore or animal-based for X amount of time. Do you find that people can do temporary stents of it, get benefit, come back to eating a moderate amount of, you know, 
carbohydrates or a moderate amount of fruit and then dabble back in if they start feeling symptomatic or is there ever any sort of a maintenance program that people can do if maybe they're saying like i really like how i feel but i don't know if this is something i want to do forever like what is or is there an answer for that yeah. Well, I mean, I think everything's individual, you know, what, what works for people. Like for me, I, I don't plan on ever eating plants again, unless I'm like starving to death. And like, that's like, that's, I have to, you know? Um, but that's, but that's me. I have, I have access to this stuff. I, I, I prefer feeling really good. I know other people that have done carnivore, like good friends of mine, that have done carnivore for like nine months. And they're like, you know what? I actually really like drinking on the weekends. And then they sort of start slipping off it from that, or I like bread or something. And that's fine. And that's, that's their, you're not friends with them. Anymore. You know, that, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, you say like, get out. You're dead. And, uh, but uh, you know, but that, but that's fine. You know, that that's that, that's their priorities. You know, their priorities are they they like these this taste and enjoyment and things like that. But then you talk to them, and they're like, I actually felt you know better than I ever have. But you know, I just sort of slipped off of it. And then it, a lot of people think that if they slip off of it, you know, they're never welcome back in the club anymore, and they're just you know, oh, I guess I failed. I can never do it again. But of course, you can always you can always come back to it. And uh, and especially if you notice that you're feeling a lot better, some people do notice that when they're like, wow, I, I really felt pretty crummy when I came off of this, they can use that as a, as a reinforcer to, you know, stick to it. But no, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, you, you can definitely come in, you can, dip, you can dip in and out if you, if you want to. And we actually see in, um, you know, different studies when people are like just purely weight loss, where people are losing weight, they lose a whole bunch of weight and then they get it all right back. Right. And they, and they end up at the same weight at the end of it. Well, actually, you've done a lot of different uh, benefits to your metabolism, to your health. That that person that's dipped down into back into you know losing weight and then back up to the same weight, they do better than the person that just maintain that weight the whole time. They actually have better health outcomes. So it, it's perfectly reasonable um, to to do that. You actually still get benefit um, if it's obviously. I, I think it's it's best if you just avoid these sorts of things altogether. But if but it, it's not a bad thing if you go in and then go out. Um, your body does heal a lot after a long time. You'll have leaky gut, which is just, just breaking. You have, you have these tight junctions between your enterocytes and your in your intestines, and those can actually be physically damaged. And so, instead of having this barrier protection you have in your skin, you sort of almost have these like micro cuts on your skin, and things can just soak in. Bacteria on your skin can get in that way. Same same is true for your gut, and so different different toxins that exist in plants that would all, normally never get in your system. Your body wouldn't wouldn't let it in they're now getting in and they can cause problems. A lot of lectins that are a big problem here. Uh, they can sort of slip in. And this is actually a, um, thought to be a driver of autoimmune issues, especially with lectins, because A, lectins can bind to your uh, insulin receptors, sometimes even more tightly than insulin. So you can actually, even if you're on keto, but you're having like uh, high uh, um, lectin foods, you can actually get an insulin response. And this is why some people, they go and they do keto and they're doing really well, but then they sort of hit a plateau and they're like, they don't really, they're not, getting the final results and not like really getting, you know, you know, jacked and shredded like other people are. And then they, you know, go full carnivore and then they're getting rid of these lectins and bang, they drop like, you know, 15 pounds pretty quickly. That's, that's generally that, that's sort of also insulin, uh, or sorry, uh, inflammation and uh, water weight. They can, they can lose a little more there. Eventually those tight junctions will heal if you're, if you stop sort of attacking it and then you'll, you'll sort of block off a lot of these, sort of insults. So even someone with, with like autoimmune issues after, you know, say six months or so their, their gut's going to be healed. And a lot of these bad actors are not going to be getting in their system. You can, you can start sort of doing more. So even, even if, even if you're staying in, in just like strict carnivore, I, I usually talk to people, you know, uh, caution people with uh, autoimmune issues that maybe after like six months or so, maybe you can try pork, maybe you can try chicken, maybe you can try a bit of dairy and, and see how you go. And quite often they'll, they'll do okay. Um, if you start eating, you know, if, if, if you have lead pipes in your house and you get lead poisoning and you get rid of the lead pipes and you recover from lead poisoning, you start drinking the lead water again, you know, eventually you're going to get lead poisoning. It's going to be lesser. And, you know, if you really go overboard, you can make yourself sick again. It will take time to do that. But your body's going to be in a much better position, obviously, to handle those, those sorts of toxins if, if you've healed from it. So um, I don't. I don't think that, um, you know, it's uh, what I would do, 
But if people did want to do it, yes, you will heal from things. And if you sort of reintroduce things and maybe say like, you know, actually coffee, I don't really mind it. I don't really mind the effects. It actually feel pretty good and, and I'm getting more benefit. And I'm enjoying the social aspect of it or something like that. Some people will do that. And I think that that's perfectly fine. I, I try when I when I'm talking to my patients about it, I try to talk to them about making this a way of life and thinking this is just this is just how I live now because it, it's easier. And, and if you think of it as a diet, then you're thinking of that as something temporary. They're just trying to you know get into your you know prom dress again and then you know uh, and then that's it. And then you you start doing the same things that got you into that position in the first place and then you get back in the position that you were. So I try to think of it as more long term like this is this is just sort of a way of life that you know, we should just try to do this forever. But you know if people sort of dip in and dip out, uh, that's still better than not doing it all. Absolutely. Or just understanding the framework of it, you know, and being able to arm themselves with the ability to do that, I think counts for something. But yeah, I'm with you. Like, I mean, if you go into anything, whether it's carnivore, whether it's keto, whether it's whatever it is, if your ultimate goal is purely body composition, it's generally a short lived adventure anyway. I mean, it's just like, I, I so I mean, I like the angle that you're going at. It's interesting because there's, there's almost two sides here. Okay. So, and when you talk about the lead pipe thing, it just brought to mind this situation of like, I lived in a multi house for a while. Right. And this, the first thing, like you can do everything you could possibly think of until you're blue in the face to rid your body of mold. But the most powerful thing you can do is get yourself out of that environment, period. Right. And until exactly. you get yourself out of the environment, you're just like bailing out a boat that just has a water coming in faster than you can bail it out or at least equally. Right. So with that sort of analogy, it's almost like there's two sides to what you're talking about here. There's a side where, okay, carnivore or animal-based eliminates these variables, or let's even just call them question marks because yes, there's data on it, but let's just pretend for a second they're question marks, just even for the sake of just uh, claims and being just as simple as possible. Let's say they're variables. You're eliminating those variables, which is great. But then there's another side that's potentially... Uh, mitigating issues and actually rectifying problems. So there's almost this elimination side and a potential healing side, right? Now, that potential healing side, is that coming? Well, you probably don't know the answer for sure, but obviously there's some argument that maybe that's the presence of ketones that are doing something, uh, which certainly could be the case. We know there's histone deacetylase uh, inhibition, all this kind of stuff that can possibly help us to sort of remodel. I know there's gut biome benefits, there's all this is the sort of healing side, and I say it just with air quotes, just to be sort of safe. Do you think, what is that coming from? Like independent of ketones, where is this mm. additional benefit coming from in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think the main thing is, is you're eliminating toxins. You're, you're eliminating things that cause direct harm to your body. Um, just, to, just on the ketone side, I think that you know, we've, we've sort of misnamed uh, you know the, the fasting state. I think that if you look at if you look at just biochemistry, like that, that's where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear. Um, that's that's we we become a lot more healthy. We are able to mobilize energy much more efficiently. Um, our brains work better. You know, our brains actually really like running on ketones. When you get up to a certain threshold of ketones, it actually doesn't matter how how high your glucose is, your, your brain will just bang switch over to ketones. And we see this benefiting you know, people like Alzheimer's and dementia, which is you know we have peripheral insulin resistance in our tissue. You also have that in your brain. And so, you know, that's just not getting enough energy and food and nutrition to the brain. And all of a sudden you switch over to ketones and, and they, they do remarkably better very quickly. And even like a high fat ketogenic diet, they've had trials showing that, um, that just a, a high fat ketogenic diet had a better treatment outcome for Alzheimer's patients than every medication ever trialed for Alzheimer's. You know, so that that's very promising and very interesting, um, and but like a, a lot of things, and and you, know, you mentioned Dr. Saladino, and who I you know I agree on with like ninety five percent of what what he talks about. Um, you know, we differ on on sugar. I don't think that's a good idea. You know, he doesn't have a problem with it. Fine. You know, but that's that's not that big of a of a deal. But um, as far as just having you know just a disagreement on something. Um, but you know what we definitely agree, agree on is that that plants have defense chemicals and they use them in order to defend themselves in nature. You know nature's wild. it's it's kill or be killed for plants as well as animals. And plants are living organisms. They like to stay living organisms. And while animals can run away or fight back, plants can't. And so one of their main deterrents and one of their main defenses is is actually using, toxic chemicals. And, and we, we know this inherently, you know, most plants in the world are inedible. You know, you get lost out in the woods, you run out of food, you can't just eat any random plant. You know, most of them will make you very sick or even kill you. 
you know, the same is true of spinach. It's not that spinach is not poisonous. It's just not as poisonous to us because we have some defenses against what's in spinach. Whereas like a koala is not going to do as well on spinach, but it does great on eucalyptus. We would not do well on eucalyptus. So they have these defense chemicals and certain animals have certain defenses against them, but the defense chemicals exist. And so when you eat outside of your, of your species specific diet, and I, I, Diet is very specific in nature. Like animals eat very, very specific things. If they're eating plants, they eat specific plants. And even animals that only, that are complete herbivores and only eat plants, most plants will still kill them. You know, most plants are still inedible to them. So they eat very, very, very specific plants. And so when you eat outside of that, when you're eating plants that we didn't really encounter, you know, for the last 2 million years, we're not going to be as, as set up to defend ourselves against these things. Very, very good demonstration of that. You know, you know, we come from, from, uh, you know, European descent, right? We've had, uh, cultivation and, um, you know, agriculture for around the eight sort of last 8,000 years or so. Um, and then we're sort of eating hunter gatherers sort of the last, and, and then like up to like 20,000 years ago, um, native Australians, Australian Aboriginals here and uh, native Americans as well. They, they were just really hunters. Maybe they had some, some plants here and there when they needed to. They knew which ones they needed to survive or you know, some berries in season or something like that. But mostly, most of what they ate was just meat. And we have a lot of records on that going back to the early days of the explorers. They are four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and all the rest of these chronic diseases when eating a Western diet. But they don't when they're eating just a carnivore diet. Hmm. And... So that, that's a very good demonstration there. They, they don't, we, we have certain populations that have been exposed to, uh, you know, crop, crop agriculture. And, and we've had some genetic changes and modifications to have, have a little more defense against them. And, and then the Australian Aboriginals and other, other native populations that have not had that don't have those, those defenses built up. So they get, they get much more sick, much more quickly. When I, when I first moved to Australia, uh, I started working in the hospital systems here. I was told like right away, if you know you have an Aboriginal patient that comes in, whatever their age is, add 20 to it because that's just how they age. They age much quicker. And so you have a 40 year old come in, you got to treat them for the for the diseases that you would normally expect in a 60 year old because they're they just break down. They're just they're just breaking down much quicker. And I think that that is just a direct cause from these toxins that uh, we we encounter in plants and. You know, it, it seems strange because we've been told for 50 years that, you know, the, the vegetables are the best things you could ever eat. And yes, they do have nutrients, but it's a bit problematic because those nutrients come with toxins as well. And also the, the nutrients aren't really bioavailable either. So there's, there's a bit of an issue there, but they do come with these toxins. And so it's, um, you know, it's, it's just important to remember that and, and just remember that, that, you know, plants are living things and, and they, and they are able to defend themselves. There's an entire field of botany that has been covering this. And we've known for thousands of years about, you know, these plants are safe to eat. These ones only under these conditions and things like that. And that's, and, and that's a hard science. You know, we have, we have, we have hard evidence. We, we know the names and we've categorized like all these different poisons and toxins that are in plants. They're just in plants. You know, the WHO has a page, uh, I'll send it to you uh, all about, you know, just natural toxins that we, that we encounter in just normal uh, plants that we eat all around the world. You know, I mean, you look at, at cassava root, that's the third most important, uh, cal caloric, uh, source in the third world. It has, a, it has a deadly amount of cyanide yeah. in it. You know, if you don't prepare that properly, you will die. Kidney beans, very normal bean to eat. If you don't boil that thing, it's lectins are so powerful that just like five or six of these things will make you very, very sick and, and potentially even, even uh, fatal if you have enough of these things. So you can do things to them. You can uh, you can boil them. You can do these sorts of things. But all these things, what they're doing is they are denaturing and making things less toxic. What does that mean? It means these things are naturally toxic. And I think that uh, that's a major, major, major driver of disease these days. And and also we're, we're doing things like we used to do all these things with like nightshades with like tomatoes and, and potatoes. 
that that have solanine and all these other things. Like seventy people a year still die from eating potatoes for Christ's sake. I mean, like, <laughs> like potatoes, you know. Yeah. And um, and so you know, this is why we used to peel potatoes because the skin was barrier protection. That's where the higher concentration of poison was. But then they said, oh, that's where all the all the vitamins are. You need to keep the skin. Like why are we where are we skinning these things? Like you know, never take down a fence if you don't know why it was put up in the first place. You yep. know. And yep. so they they're skinning. The, we used to skin these things. We used to vine ripen tomatoes, take the skins off, take the seeds out. Those were the most toxic areas of of the of the tomato and and vine ripening it makes it much less toxic a green tomato has much higher levels of solanine and then vine ripening but not 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 shelf ripening gets a lot of those out but if you put it on if you pick it green a lot of those things are retained in there and that's and that's why you can tell the difference between like like a like a you know just a box ripened tomato it just doesn't taste as nice as like a, a vine ripened tomato and and then we're, we're eating the skin and we're eating the seeds and things like that too we're having more problems so I think that's that's the major problem or, or the major benefit from from uh, eating carnivore. And that's what I tell people is like, like, yes, you eat meat that that's, you know, the meat and the fat that gives you the nutrients that you need to, to drive your body and to, and to be healthy. But it, the real trick is not eating all the other stuff because the other stuff is causing direct harm. And so I think that's that's a major, major driver of that. Well, and I think I think one of the biggest sort of errors that's out there as far as information right is that you're not going to be able to get nutritional value from meat right that, that's think that's that's a very that's something that's out there that's frustrating for all parties the fact that that is no matter what kind of diet you eat the fact that that is discounted so much and you know i try to look at both sides as much as i possibly can and on one hand i'm saying okay well we've got toxins and lectins and what we get in the skin and all these different components of various vegetables. Okay, so boil them to reduce those. But in the essence of boiling them, you're also reducing the vitamin content too. So it's like you're kind of back at square one in a lot of ways. And I've posed this argument before, sort of as just without any bias whatsoever, right? With like, I don't, it, so it's just kind of interesting because it's like, okay, well, yeah, you sort of do bring yourself back to square one. But then it kind of, it leads me to think, okay, what about from the side of fruit, right? Okay, so we have fruit where, a plant is bearing something that arguably is there to eat or is it and like i know you and paul differ on in the opinion of sugar from fruit but independent of fructose and and sugar uh what sort of your stance on fruit like i i'm not a botanist right so i i can't stand here and say hey uh, a blueberry is designed for to provide life to other life forms i don't think that's the case i know that plants are out for themselves right so um what's sort of your your take on fruit yeah well i think I, you know, you're right i mean i think that that fruit is is one of those areas that that has a bit more nuance uh, to it um sugar i think is just problematic but uh, that actually comes into it as well, uh, interestingly enough. Let's talk about the non, non-sugar non containing uh, berries or, or fruits though. Think about how many berries will just kill you. You know I mean? Yeah, that's like, like a, a normal thing, like, you know, tribes is like, don't eat the red berries, yep. you know, right? So, so what is that? That's a fruit, you know? And, well, but the plant wants you to eat that. Well, no, not necessarily. It wants something to eat it. Not necessarily you, you know, like the cassowary bird that's like sort of in the tropics um, around, well, in like Australia and and um, uh, Papua New Guinea, it, it eats tropical fruits. It, there's 150 different um, different varieties of tropical fruit that this eats. Those things will kill you. Those tropical fruits will kill you and basically kill anything else. And that's because the seed germinates in the gut of the cassowary bird. And so without the cassowary bird eating that fruit, that that plant does not propagate. That's it. So it's in it's in the plant's best interest to not let anything except the cassowary bird eat it. And so, you know, obviously it's not thinking that, but that's just this coevolution that's come around. And so if if the cassowary bird leaves an area, those trees are gone, you know? And if other things are eating that fruit, obviously the cassowary bird doesn't get to it you know, then it doesn't make it either. So it's, it's in its best interest to be poisonous to the animals that aren't the right kind of animal. Right. And so, you know, I mean, a tomato is a, is a fruit and it's got poisons. We know that, you know, it's not, not going to kill you. It'll kill a dog, yeah. you know? And so, you know, it's, it's, it's got, it's, you know, different things are, are more or less sensitive to things. Um, but, but that's the thing. Most, most fruit will, is still toxic, you know, to humans. Um, not necessarily deadly, but a lot of them are, and I think the majority of them are. And um, 
when you're looking at so that that's 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 that side you know the fruit is still you know not necessarily wanting us to eat it right when you come to to sweetened fruits with fructose the idea evolutionary from an evolutionary standpoint is that fructose is like the sweetest sugar to humans because we recognize it as sort of a safe source of new, of of you know calories and so we and because we don't really know of anything containing fructose that is like acutely poisonous for humans they will like kill you that day right so it's thought that you know our ancestors that that recognize this is like oh okay that kind of tastes nice because taste is a big thing right you know like i was talking about with the steak you know like bitter taste you know what kids are eating broccoli and just going oh my god and just like hating that you know that's because it's recognized your brain and your tongue are sophisticated machines and they can recognize harmful chemicals and so if something is bitter or or bad tasting and give that if it's something that like you know uh, you know a, a 12 month old kid is not going to eat and just initially pulls back from you should think about that you should think about why that is and so the people that have recognized like oh okay that that one doesn't taste bitter that one doesn't taste horrible um maybe maybe this is okay um those are the ones that sort of maybe uh, had, hadn't had a survival advantage when times were rough you know like like lions and other felines they've been carnivore for so long that basically every plant on earth will kill them, right? Same with dog, but not, not to the same degree as, as felines. Um, that's good in certain ways, but at the same time, that, that makes them limited. And so when, when resources are scarce and they can't get a kill, they're dead. Yeah. Humans aren't like that. We, we, we come from an herbivorous background much more recently than uh, canines or felines. And so, and, and also we have you know, agriculture and things like that. We were able to, to uh, you know, crossbreed things and make them less bitter things. I mean, think about a, a, like an eggplant. Yeah. Like I remember talking to my parents and she, and they were, my mom was just like, these things were so bitter and so terrible when I was a kid, they were awful. Like yeah. it, was, it was just a different plant now. You know, you're breeding these things down to be less toxic. You can do that. And I think we have done that. Um, but, you know, and that has given us a survival advantage you know, we we're a very robust species, I and mean, this is why we've we've we're all over the world we're on all seven continents. Um, that's because we can survive in pretty pretty wild uh, times, and we can and we can survive on certain things that other pe that other animals can't. Um, one of those things that we recognize as safe is is fructose. So that seems to be a thing. So that we can say like, okay, hey, this is safe. This is not going to kill me. I can get a quick hit of energy and then I can go on and, and do my thing. I can get some energy in, and, that, and that helps. And that gives a survival advantage. But, you know, I think long term, you know, fructose is problematic. And fructose is, I mean, we've, we've seen this from the UCSF uh, biochemistry department um, showing that fructose gets metabolized into the same breakdown products yeah. as uh, alcohol does. And so you get the same problems from those breakdown products. And, you know, Dr. Lustig from UCSF has actually, you know, done uh, experiments with, with kids with um, metabolic disease and actually, you know, having like fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome and actually reversing metabolic syndrome by keeping things isocaloric, so the same amount of calories, but just replacing fructose with glucose. So they're still eating bagels and carbs and pizza and all that sort of rubbish, but they're not eating, you know, donuts and juice and sodas and things like that. And they were, and they reversed their metabolic syndrome actually quite readily. And they actually met the the uh, criteria for causation, the Bradford Hill uh, criteria for causation. So it's a very, it's a very good, interesting study. Um, so I think long term, you 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 will run into problems. I think short term, if you're in the woods and you're hungry, something sweet is your best friend. I mean, that's absolutely the case. I, I would I would eat fruit in that in that case, yeah. you know. But um, I think that long term, you're going to run into problems uh, with metabolic uh, syndrome, and I think even short term, you can you can disrupt your your metabolism as well you know it it uh it will obviously raise insulin and that causes metabolic issues which i you know i, I think get you out of your primary metabolic state that's the primary metabolic state of basically every animal in the wild we have studies with wolves going back to 1981 showing that you know they're in this ketogenic state they say like well you need carbs to burn carbs that was the idea back then and and probably still now for a lot of people and um, and they said, well, you know, wolves don't carbo low before they chase caribou for ten hours. So you know, do they have blood sugar? Do they have glycogen? And they found out, yes, they do, and it's rock solid. It does not change no matter what they're doing. It's very steady because they're re constantly replenishing their their glucose and their and their glycogen from their fat stores. And and we do that as well when we're in that state. And so that's why I think that that that's our primary state. Um, and I think the only reason we call it a fed state and a fasting state the way we do is because by the time we're able to look at 
our biochemistry at a molecular level, everyone was eating carbohydrates. And so it's just like, oh, when you yeah. eat, it looks like this. And when you don't eat, it looks like that. Pretty simple. But the, what they fail to realize is that when you eat anything at all except carbohydrates, it also looks like you're in this fasting state. Precisely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's kind of interesting because like, you know, we are so... Well, everything in the body at the end of the day comes back to a feedback loop. And when we're consistently having these undulations in glucose, think about how that affects a feedback loop. I mean, at the end of the day, I try to take a balanced approach, but I'm still a I'm still a low carb proponent, right? That's still who I am at my core. And I keto for the last 12 years, right? So it's like, I mean, obviously cycling in and out, but the lion's share of that 12 years has been strict keto. And I come back to that all the time. It's like, okay, if, if we're looking at feedback loops, Every time you're essentially having carbohydrates, yes, it's the role of your body to come back to homeostasis via whatever loop, right? But then when we're talking about not having carbohydrates, you're not having these constant pings to that feedback loop. So of course, things are going to be a lot more stable. You're essentially making that feedback loop a little bit, I don't want to say muted, but almost attenuated or just not as necessary. And I think people, you mentioned something because you, uh, you talked about glucose from fat. I think people don't realize that you don't just create glucose via gluconeogenesis from protein. You also create it from the glycerol backbone as well. And so in other words, for people that are watching this, that are low carb, that are possibly afraid about, you know, I hear it all the time, protein, kicking them out of keto, things like that. First of all, it doesn't really exist. Gluconeogenesis is demand, yeah. demand driven, not supply driven. So, but also that, that bulletproof coffee you're having just for essence of conversation, that could very well hypothetically spike your glucose just as much as that you know, 12 ounces of chicken. It's so you just touched on a good point that doesn't get talked about a lot. And I'm glad that you mentioned it, that fat can contribute to these glucose, stable glucose levels as well. Um, and it's just such an interesting point. And there, there's one other thing, and then I want to kind of move on and talk a little bit about insulin directly, just talking about um, just various phytotoxins and things like that. I mean, is there an argument, and I've heard people bring this up in conversation to me, is, is there an argument that a small amount of these poisons or these toxins can actually have a hormetic effect and make us better in the short term at dealing with them? Or are we potentially looking at something that is evolutionary that's not going to really benefit us, but it's going to potentially wouldn't really benefit us for generations? So is it really worth it, uh, if that question makes sense? Yeah. No, yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is it's, it's a good question. You know, I mean, like, you know, because there are things that have a hormetic effect. Uh, I mean, think of arsenic, like arsenic will just kill you. But like actually like, tiny, tiny doses have actually been shown to actually provide a benefit, which is funny, you know, yeah. because like we actually use, use that in some processes. But, you know, you, you get right outside of that range and you're in, in trouble. So that's the thing you have to think about with with plant toxins as well. OK, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe there's a hormetic effect with, um, you know, uh, toxin A in uh, in a certain plant. Um, well, at what dose is it hermetic? Has it has, does it have a hermetic effect? You know, too low doesn't do anything. Too high is causing harm. You have to get you know yeah. you know in in, um, in 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 you know medicine we have that sort of treatment window, that therapeutic window we call it for a medication. This is why we do a lot of trials and things like that to say, okay, does this A does this do any good? B does this cause a lot of harm? C what is what is the the dosage that actually does anything? What's the dosage range, and and we have to do a lot of experiments for that, like you know, sort of uh, uh, you know, multi stage uh, trials doing that. So you know, what are they for the hermetic effect? The possible if there's a hermetic effect, you know, did we test that? Did we do that? No, we haven't. Did we test on, on what doses we're going to get it? No, we haven't. So we don't really know. So maybe there can be hormetic effect from one of these toxins. Another problem is you don't know what dosage that is. You have no idea if you're getting a hormetic effect, or you're getting a toxic effect. The other compounding factor is, is there's like tens of thousands of plant toxins and there'd be multiple, multiple toxins in any given plant at all. So, so maybe, you know, toxin A is hormetic at dosage X and you, you just hit that perfectly. Are all the other, you know, thousands of, of toxins that are in that one plant all hormetic? And all hormetic at the exact level that you're getting them in for, for getting that hormetic effect, uh, uh, you know, toxin A. I think it's very unlikely that you're just going to guess that. Yeah. And they're just going to just happen upon that in, in, a, in a random fashion. It's possible. It's 100% possible. But it's very unlikely that you're going to stumble upon that. 
and everyone's sort of eating a different amount. So obviously there's going to be one guy who gets it right and everyone else gets it for wrong. Sure. So I think sure. it's, it's, it's potential, but I don't think that it it's practical. And I think that the other things involved are probably almost certainly not going to be hermetic as well. Certain things are going to be medicinal. You can use things medicinally. And a, a medicine, what is a medicine? Medicine is just a poison that causes more good than harm in under certain circumstances. Yeah. And so maybe that happens with certain plants as well. We've been using plants medicinally forever, you know, like Galen, you know, the Roman, uh, uh, you know, doctor, very, very famous. He was a doctor for Marcus Aurelius. You know, he had these things called gal galenicals and they were like these different concoctions of different herbs. We were, we were following those basically for 1500 years. It's just like, basically like you taught medicine, you, you basically just read Galen. That's yeah. how they taught medicine for 1500 years after that guy he was very, very uh, influential. And and we had gal galenicals and that was, that was it, these different concoctions. So those can be used, that certainly can be used and have that and that beneficial effect but under certain circumstances and under very specific doses and it comes with a, a whole bag of other problems as well so i think that it's um for me i still still uh stay away yeah no totally man it's, it's always an interesting kind of thought right it's and it's if at the end of the day it's causing more harm than good i think it's interesting i mean you look at it plant medicine you look at it like you know medicine in general plant medicine and you kind of understand there is a dose, there is a, you know, and that's not something you can make the argument with plants be like, okay, well, if you're just eating them willy nilly, like, what is your dose? Like, what are you, you know, that's yeah. uh, so I mean, it's a very interesting way to put it for sure. And I, I makes a lot of sense moving in. So like surrounding the side of, of insulin, I want to wrap this up and kind of like bring it home with this. You know, we talked early before we went, uh, went live, like surrounding the world of insulin, chronically high levels of insulin, like, Okay, I think this is a big issue. And I know a lot of people are going to come out of different communities and say that insulin is not an issue. But when you're talking about it chronically being elevated, I mean, that is not a natural physiological state to begin with, right? It's mm -hmm. so, I mean, can you kind of maybe just rattle off a few of the problems that come to mind, like when people have these chronically high levels of insulin? As far as insulin resistance in particular I, I think this is this is a very interesting topic for 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 disease there's quite a lot of things um that you know blood sugar when it goes up past a certain point is actually toxic you know the glucose molecules physically fuse to other molecules like glycation or glycosylation and actually damages the 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 you know the the molecules that it comes into is your HbA1c it's a marker of of damage from that that process uh, in diabetics this is what kills diabetics just chronically high blood sugar is just damaging your body and eventually you get organ dysfunction um, so in, in it sort of I think of it as a sort of a defensive mechanism your insulin goes up and just tries to get this down and suppress that down but high insulin uh, obviously, insulin, insulin is a very powerful hormone. It has, has a lot of uh, properties in your body. And if you get too high, then you're going to sort of get these things out of proportion, out of whack. Like you were saying, everything's sort of in a balance. Everything's, uh, you know, just trying to work off each other. And uh, and then you get something really out of out of uh, proportion. It's, it's just going to shut these things down. And insulin is one of those. Um, it can actually cause you just to overeat. First of all, your, your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up, your blood sugar drops down quite low. Uh, and then you're like, oh gosh, now I need to eat more. You need to eat more carbs just to sort of bounce up, bounce up your blood sugar or else you feel like crap. It also blocks leptin, which is a hormone that's, we get stretch receptors from our stomach that secrete leptin when, when they're full. This is why people said eat a lot of fiber because that'll stretch that out, secrete leptin, and you'll think that you're full. Um, but the majority of it comes from your fat cells and tells your brain how much how much energy you have, right? It's like a running gas gauge. And so when you're blocking that with insulin, your brain all of a sudden thinks that you don't have the fat stores that you do. So it says, oh, actually, we need to eat more. And your blood sugar is dropping. It goes, okay, now we really got to eat more. So you send out hunger signals, hunger signals, and it can even be panicking like, hey, you know, get something. So people get very panicky. That's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, we know like, you know, think about like, um, you know, fertility is a major thing, you know, fertility rates have gone down in, in Western countries. There's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the reasons like the people that are actually trying to get pregnant and have kids are that, that those rates are, are getting lower. It's harder and harder for people to get pregnant. Well, one of those reasons is polycystic ovarian syndrome, so PCOS. That's the most common cause of infertility in women. That is now being understood to mostly be driven by just hyperinsulinemic state. You know, it's actually quite interesting. Women don't make estrogen directly. It's actually derived from cholesterol. Most of our hormones are derived from cholesterol. And 
they don't make estrogen directly. They make testosterone first, and then that's converted into estrogen in their ovaries. But having high levels of insulin actually blocks that conversion. So they'll end up having too much testosterone and not enough estrogen. And then you can you can obviously you know, have, have hormonal problems because of that. And, and certain people will develop PCOS as well. And just by going on a ketogenic diet, that just goes away, you know, because your insulin levels come down gradually. And then eventually that will just, that will just resolve. Um, you know, for, for people in the fitness industry, you know, people say like, oh, you know, don't eat at night or whatever. That, that really only, that, that mostly just matters when you're eating carbohydrates because insulin, when it goes up, it actually blocks the, uh, the function of growth hormone, which is, you know, predominantly like you have the biggest bolus, um, are secreted sort of about two hours after you go to sleep, you get these big hits of, of growth hormone as you sleep. And that can actually counter that. And you, even during the day, you'll be getting these sort of cyclical pulses of growth hormone throughout the day. And, and when you're working out, you do big he heavy workout, you actually produce more growth hormone as well to, to try to recover from that and rebuild from that. Um, and, uh, and high insulin will block that. We'll, 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 we'll slow it down anyway. Um, another one is uh, Alzheimer's, which we sort of touched on before, is now being sort of referred to as type 3 diabetes. And that's, um, and that's because it, it shares very similar metabolic, you know, sort of issues with type 2 diabetes. And like I said, sort of that, that peripheral insulin resistance in that tissue in your brain that's resistant. Now you, you, that, that glucose isn't getting in. It's sort of bouncing off the walls. It's not getting in, not getting in. And then you switch over to, you know, a ketogenic um you know, diet and all of a sudden, bang, you know, your brain just starts working again. Um, you, you look at MRI, the brain is sort of atrophying because you're chronically for years, it's not getting enough energy. It, it's going to sort of shrivel away. And also, you know, this, these are going to be the same people that have also, you know, because you have, you have studies looking at people that have, have si higher saturated fat, have higher LDL levels, actually have much lower rates of dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And so that's, it's protective. Why is that? Our brain is made of fat. It's made out of cholesterol. If you're, if you're eating these things and you're having higher saturated fat, you're having higher LDL, then you're, you're going to be able to build and maintain the structures, the physical structures of your brain. Um, so you know, Alzheimer's can be looked at. There was, there's actually, you know, people thought that, you know, it's these, these beta amyloid plaques that get in your brain and sort of get these tangles around your, your brain cells. Um, but that's actually been recently uh, debunked. You know, we found out that and very recently, sort of in with, within the last month or so, that the original sort of studies that made that claim that said, oh, these tangles, that's what drive this, this disease. They actually found that they sort of fudged their data and uh, it wasn't, wasn't really good. And so it actually doesn't look like they, they actually proved what they, they set out to prove. Um, we still don't know why the, we get these beta amyloid plaques, these, these, these tangles. Um, I, I read a paper the other day sort of saying that it might actually be autoimmune driven. And so that's, that's sort of an interesting thing, which, which again, um, you know, ties into, you know, just eliminating out things that are going to be drivers of autoimmune will be quite beneficial to that. Um, and then, you know, even just, just, just basic things like hypertension, you know, hypertension, there's a number of different causes of hypertension, but for people that don't have like the weird, wild, wonderful things like fem uh, like a pheochromocytoma, which is like just a tumor that's just secreting a bunch of, uh, you know, like, you know, like adrenaline, things like that, that just like jack up your blood pressure all the time. Um, that a lot of these guys and, and women are, it, are, are getting high blood pressure because of, of insulin resistance. They have chronically high insulin and your body's just like, nope, you've, you've lied to me before. I'm not believing it anymore. And they don't listen to their insulin. And, uh, and that, and that can, uh, affect your artery arteries because your arteries actually, um, can dilate from an insulin signal. And so if you're getting just chronically high insulin, it's just like, okay, I'm not listening to you anymore. So they won't dilate from those insulin signals anymore. And so they'll just stay small and that increases blood pressure. So we find that people uh, have, you know, once, once they go onto like a, even just a keto diet or a carnivore diet or whatever, and a lot of studies with keto, um, after a couple months, they just come off all their blood pressure medications. I see that in practice as well. One of, and, and this is, sort of more than just, you know, blood pressure, because you know, most people don't think about blood pressure as that big of a deal until like the end result when they yeah. stroke out and they, you know, head, head is full of blood, uh, which is what I see in neurosurgery, unfortunately. Um, and, and that's a real, that's a real thing. Um, 
But you know, one of the first signs of, of hypertension and, and this problem, this insulin driven, insulin resistant driven hypertension is actually erectile dysfunction. And that's something that, you know, a lot of guys don't want to have. I don't really know of any guy that would want to have that, but it's, um, it's one of those things It's an early thing because you, know, you don't have that compliance in your vessels and it's not able to expand and draw in more blood. Uh, and you can't get you can't get the erections that you normally did. People are like, oh gosh, this, this isn't really working. That's one of the major drivers of that. And so even just going on to like a ketogenic diet and getting your body, getting your insulin levels down back into normal ranges, that can actually help. You know, very practical things like that. And so, uh, yeah, there's quite quite a lot of things. In, insulin is a driver of a lot of diseases that uh, that people don't even that aren't even really aware that they're involved in. Yeah, and I think that's. I mean, that's the message that a lot of people you know, in sort of this circle are trying to get out there, right? It's like, if there's one thing that people can educate, educate on, and it's just, it's a very powerful hormone. It's not just, it's mm. sole job is not just letting glucose into a cell. I mean, it's not yeah. that it's a, if arguably a relatively small job at the end of the day, it's just, so mm. I think having an understanding of that, no matter which way you go about it, again, like if you're going carnivore, awesome. If you're going keto, great. But be aware of it. Be aware of insulin as something that is a very, very powerful hormone. And I kind of want to, you know, circle back and wrap this thing up, but I want to end on something sort of fun. If you could eat one food, only one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Yeah, I, I think I'm doing it. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I just ribeyes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but, you know, that, that was the thing, you know, I, I, I say that, um, you know, that, that, that doing this is like, just felt like I'm, it's my birthday every day. You know, because like, you know, on your birthday, you get like the meal, the thing, no, you know, guilt free. This is, this is what you want. You don't have to worry about calories. You don't have to worry about fat. You don't have to worry about all these different problems. You're just like, it's my birthday. I can do whatever the hell I want. It's my day. That was always just a big steak. <laughs> you know, like a Brene. So I think every time I just wanted just some big, massive hunk of meat and like, and that's it. And maybe some prawns or whatever, like, but that's what I wanted. And so now every single day I'm having a big, amazing steak. And I mean, literally for years that I was, I've been doing this, I mean, I started this 22 years ago and um, inadvertently just because I, you know, was learning in college, just how toxic plants were. And I was just like, okay, I'm not eating plants because those, those things are, are deadly. And I had a, a cancer biology teacher actually going in and there were like tons of carcinogens and all these sorts of things. We're all just blown away. And he just said to us, he's like, yeah, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. And I'm like, right, screw plants. And I just, I just stopped eating them. And um, then I sort of slipped off it and came back to it, you know, uh, several years later. And so like, I've been doing this again for like, for the last five, five years or so now. Um, really hard, hardcore and really getting into it and, and realizing what I was doing. Because before I was just not eating plants. Whereas now I'm just, I'm doing this specifically. Yeah. And at first I was just doing this and every single day I'd have this big steak and I'm just like, God, this is amazing. And I was so happy every single day. And every single day I was having the exact same thing. And I was just, it was just great. So that's, um, yeah, if I could do that. And, um, and now I get to do that. And so it's like, like every single day it's my birthday. I get to have this big, amazing steak. And now, I, you know, because I've been doing this a lot, I've been like, I know how to make a really good steak. I'm like, yeah. I wet age them, I dry age them. I, I, you know, I cook these things up. They have this like amazing crust. I'm just like every day, like it's, it's weird to me. I even catch myself out doing it, but I'll like cut off a piece and eat it. And I was just like, that's good. Like every day I'm like, Oh, that's so good. And I'll say it out loud and I'll catch myself. I'm like, it's ridiculous that I'm saying this still, <laughs> but like I do, it's like, it's, you know, I still do. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah. So that's, um, that's, that's what I need. Just big steak. That's a good answer, man. I think for me, it'd <laughs> probably be like a, just, I'm just, I'm a sucker for duck eggs, man. Like I just like the buttery, mm. just, I don't know, duck eggs are, I mean, I, I like eggs in general, but something about duck eggs, man, just the, just giant yolk. And it's just like, I don't know. People ask me that yeah. too. Like, what would I eat? And I mean, I have, a, I have a million reasons why too, but I mean, it's just, as far as taste is concerned, it's like, that just satisfies it for me. But well, yeah, well absolutely. cool, man. Well, well, where can, where can everyone find you? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, yeah, well, I have a YouTube channel. It's just Anthony Chafee MD. And, and I try to do a lot of, I try to put out sort of two, three videos a week there. And I have a, 
a podcast called The Plant Free MD, uh, and that's sort of the audio version of basically all the things that you'll see on YouTube. So people can go either one and see very similar things. And that's where I just go through, I try to go through sort of the science and the literature and the data uh, on all these sorts of things that we we spoke about today. And I try to, I try to do that from a very, uh, you know, clinical perspective and also, you know, based in the literature. And I try to put the the studies and things like that in the description as well. And, and then I'll interview people and uh, like, like Professor Bickman, people are interested in, in the insulin sort of thing. That's, that's someone that I spoke that he's been studying this for yeah. you know, 15, 20 years. And, um, and so that's what I try to do. That's why I, I, I do most of my work. And then, um, and then just Instagram is just Anthony Chafee MD as well. And, uh, that's, that's the major ones. And there's a, a couple other little peripheral ones like Patreon and things like that. But like, that's the main ones is the YouTube uh, podcast and, uh, Instagram. Right on, man. Well, dude, it's been a pleasure. And guys, if you uh, have any specific questions for Dr. Chafee or, or anything else, just feel free to hit him down in the comments. And, and, and Doc, it's been a pleasure, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. No, not a problem, man. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. You bet.